The End to Enders panel turns 10 years old today, a decade of sharing information from experienced long trail end to enders to prospective end to enders and, uh, and anyone who, who's really interested in the long trail. Um, so thank you all again for being here. Um, my name is Rob. I'm the education and volunteer coordinator here at the Green Mountain Club. Um, and I just want to take a few minutes to, uh, to let you know of a few things about the building. Um, who is a first timer here at Green Mountain Club headquarters? All right, cool, welcome. Uh, this is our, our, our home base. Uh, we love this place and just wanna uh, make sure you know a few things about it. Um, so first off, um, again, I wanna thank you all for coming and I wanna thank our panelists here um, for, for setting their, their time aside tonight to, uh, to share their knowledge and their love of the trail with you all. Uh, it's a really awesome thing that they're doing. They're volunteering their time. Uh, and I hope you brought a lot of questions for them um, because uh, they're sure you know. eager to... No. Sorry, I'm watching myself on the screen, so I just need to, <laughs> I need to minimize that. Um, I'm glad we don't have that. <laughs> <laughs> that was really weird. Okay, I think I fixed it. Um, so anyway, they're taking their time out tonight, so please bring your, your questions to them. Uh, we'll, um, we'll talk about when that's going to happen in a moment. Um, I also want to thank uh, the online audience uh, for, for being here. Uh, you can wave at them at the camera back there. Hey, online audience. Uh, I know we have folks from as far away as North Carolina and California tuning in tonight. Uh, I think over 70 people tuning in. So thank you all for being here. Um, and finally, a huge thanks to Orca Media, our friends in the back, uh, based out of Montpelier, who have been uh, broadcasting this event for close to seven years, I think. So. It's really great to have you all back. Thank you for, for all you do for us. During your time here, I still hear myself. Hold on one second. OK. During your time here, if you need to use the bathroom, you may have found some already. Uh, there's two in the back, and there's one downstairs. Um, if you need any water, we have a couple of jugs in the back here. Um, and if we run out there, we'll refill them. Um, the exits, should you need to exit the building uh, for any emergency, the uh, best and most immediate exits are in that corner of the room and that corner of the room. Uh, and if you need elevator access, uh, we will help you with that. That's just on the other side of that wall. Um, if you need to get up and move around and stand, that's totally fine. Uh, we got a lot of room to play with here. Um, just please make sure you're not blocking anyone else's view as you're doing that. And finally, I just want to go over our general schedule for the evening. Um, this is a kind of a, a standard panel with a longer than average question and answer period from the audience because this is what this is all about. Um, I have some prearranged questions here, but I'm not going to take up too much time with them because this is about you all and the folks online as well. So we're going to start with uh, a little bit about the club. Uh, we're going to uh, actually involve the audience from the get-go with a few uh, major topics that folks want to hear, uh, hear about tonight. Uh, we're going to get our panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, we're going to have a brief slideshow after that that kind of gets us in the mood and shows us some really cool images uh, from the trail and from uh, all of their experiences. Um, and then we're going to go into the, the questions and discussion uh, part of this. And I will lead with a couple just to kind of get things flowing. Uh, but the bulk of this evening, uh, probably about an hour to an hour 15, is going to be uh, for questions uh, from you all and from our online audience as well. Um, so that's, that's really what we're here to do. Uh, finally, at the very end, uh, we're going to take probably about 15 minutes to break off. And we're going to have our panelists kind of scatter throughout the room. And you're going to be free to kind of approach them and ask questions maybe you didn't get to during the panel. Uh, or you know, take a dive into their backpack if they allow you, you know, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Ask permission before you dive into backpacks, always. <laughs> um, great. Are there um, any questions before we begin? All right. Cool. So uh, first off, um, the Green Mountain Club. The Green Mountain Club was begun in 1910 with one purpose, and that was to build a trail across the high peaks of Vermont from Massachusetts to Canada. Um, and uh, the club succeeded in doing so over the next 20 years. And that path has changed somewhat in the last century, but it has stayed true to that, that general length and the southern and northern termini. Um, and the Green Mountain Club exists today 
uh, to uh, make the Vermont mountains play a larger role in the life of the people. So we build a trail and we use it so that folks can enjoy their mountains and, and come and enjoy the beauty of Vermont from all over the world. So that is our mission. Um, and we do that uh, through education and through the stewardship of our trails and our mountains. Um, so by participating in the trail, you are participating in our mission. And uh, that's why we exist. So, so thank you for that. The goal of this specific event is to share a wide range of knowledge and expertise uh, from long trail end to enders. That is, that is folks who have traveled the entire length of the trail, either in a single push or in sections. Uh, over multiple weeks or even years. Um, and we always aim to get uh, a somewhat, you know, as much as we can, a diverse audience uh, to give you different experiences, whether that be age, gender, group, uh, race, anything. You know, we want to get the broadest um, you know, spectrum we can so that you can get the different experiences and so that they can you know, have a nice discussion and, and you get see the different um, perspectives. So that is why we are here. So now I want to know why you're here. So before we get going too much further, I would love to hear three audience members give us three just general topics, not specific questions yet, but general topics that you would love to hear about tonight. And that way we can kind of have those in the back of, of our minds as we're going further. So would anyone like to share a topic they would love to hear about this evening? Yes. Feminine needs. Feminine needs, Ooh. excellent, great broad topic, awesome. Very, and I'm sure there's a lot to, to talk about there. All right, what is a second one? Yes. Uh, just resupplying issues. Great, resupplying, all right. And finally, one more general topic, yes. Like haves and have not on the trail as far as gear goes. All right, haves and have nots, excellent. Great, thank you. All right, so we're gonna, we're gonna lodge those in the back of our minds um, to make sure we hit on those. And now, I would love to hear from our panelists. We're going to have panelists. Um, I would love you to uh, take three minutes each and uh, tell us about yourselves based on your agenda in front of you. And we'll start here with Alan. <clears throat> my name is Alan Paschel. I hiked with my partner, Morgan Irons, in 2013 and then again in 2017. Um, we share trail names. Uh, together we are pokey and tag along, depending on who's in the lead. <laughs> I am usually tag along. She's actually a stronger hiker than I am. I'm from Callis, Vermont. Um, the, our favorite location on the trail, mine, was a set of cascades that's below White Rock Mountain. Really beautiful spot. <clears throat> um, what I can offer as a panelist tonight is representing uh, the older end of the population that hikes the trail. And uh, I can tell you the pain is relative. And if you're stubborn enough, you can finish the trail. Thank you, Alan. Yep. I'm Monica Quinn. Uh, we also share a trail name with my hiking buddy, Liz, here. Um, the very first night on, on the trail, some AT hikers gave us the name Nama and Stay. So we're <laughs> Nama Stay together. <laughs> um, I'm Nama pretty much always. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm from Sudbury, Massachusetts. I've uh, been in Vermont for about four years now and did a through hike uh, last summer starting July 1st um, with, with Stay over here. <laughs> Uh, my favorite location on the trail, uh, Camel's Hump has a special place for sure. It's a pretty wild, beautiful mountain, but um, I had hiked that a lot before I did the trail, so one that I discovered on the trail was um, the Big Branch area, and um, did, spent an awesome night listening to that, that babbling brook there. So, um, Offer as a panelist, um, obviously I have a female perspective. Uh, have done a lot of different sports in my life, and uh, this is more of a longer endurance, mentally challenging one for me. So um, that was kind of a cool perspective for me that maybe I can pass on to others as well. Sweet. Um, so I'm Liz Locke, and as you know, I'm Stay. <laughs> and I got the stand because I like to stay 
wherever we are. <laughs> <laughs> Which is usually the ten. Uh, <laughs> I live here in Bolton, um, and obviously we were through hikers and together as partners. Uh, my favorite location is probably Corliss Camp. It's really super cute, uh, and we had made some LT buddies uh, and ended up having a birthday party there for one of them, and that was just a really special moment and just a nice time with the friends that we made on the trail. Uh, and what I hope to offer as a panelist, I guess, is just that I really love hiking and I really love the Green Mountains and if you're thinking about doing this, I would totally recommend it because it's a really special experience. I cried every day because I was so happy. <laughs> and most days because I was <laughs> sad too. But <laughs> <laughs> it's an emotional roller coaster. <laughs> it is an emotional roller coaster. We can talk about that more later. <laughs> um, my name is Vlad Grass. My trail name was Ender. Uh, my hometown, I live in, currently in Shelburne, Vermont. I through hiked it with my partner and father <laughs> right here. <laughs> um, my favorite location on the long trail, I think probably White Rocks. I think it was really beautiful. And I just love the environment there. It was a nice trail too. What I offer as a panelist, I think as a kind of a more unique perspective as a younger person hiking the trail, um, I think I enjoyed it a lot, and I can offer my view as someone who's 12, 13 when I hiked out. Right. Um, I'm David Grass. Um, I was born in West Bolton and uh, live in Shelburne now. Uh, we through hiked starting in mid-June and finished in mid-July. Um, we hiked uh, together. We started off with our dog, Stas, and he accompanied us for the first week. And then when we had our resupply, he saw our station wagon, and he jumped into it and refused to get out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so he was making his desires pretty clear. Um, he rejoined us for the last week. And um, after the first couple days, we had to learn how to hike with him in a way that worked for him, and we got better, so I'm happy to talk about that later. Um, favorite location for a shelter would be Theron Dean, um, which has spectacular views to the east and uh, other directions as well, and uh, it was just an amazing place to watch the sunrise. Um, also, uh, we went skinny dipping in Big Branch, Brooke, something like that, and I'll, a good one. I'll remember that too. Um, and what I offer as a panelist, um, I worked for the GMC when I was in college. Um, I was a caretaker at Griffith Lake, and um, got to meet lots of through hikers coming through, and um, admired what they were doing. I, I always wanted to hike the long trail. It felt like. If you're a Vermonter, that's, that's something that you try to do. Um, my mom hiked with my brother around the Bolton area, did some overnights, and I was always jealous because I didn't get to do one uh, with her. Um, so I was really glad to be able to do that with Vlad. And my other son, Yuri, who's 10 years old, is in back, and um, I'm sort of grooming him in hopes that we'll get to do it uh, in, in a few years together. Thanks. Thank you all. And uh, I think of special note, uh, David, Vlad, and Alan were all sitting where you are this time last year. And now they're on that side of the table. So um, if you're a prospective into Ender yourself, perhaps uh, I'll be talking to you this time next year. <laughs> and you'll be sitting here sharing your knowledge as well. Um, thank you all. So we're going to take just a couple minutes to enjoy some, some photos from all of their uh, their end to end hikes. And then we'll get into the questions. Um, so Zach, if you wouldn't mind hitting those four light switches behind should we, you. Should we get out of here? Uh, yeah, if, if you don't want to, uh, <laughs> you can feel free to rotate the chairs or, or walk aside either one. That's fine. Mm
Thanks. Those are feet. The first one was my friend. The second one were Rob's. I hope that was nice and inspiring for everyone. That's before. Toenails grow back. Toenails grow back. <laughs> It's it's scary when it happens, but they, they grow back. Yeah. Or not, you don't really need them. <laughs> All right. So I uh, I warned um, the panelists before we began that I was going to start with a, a deeply philosophical question because those are always really fun, right? Um, <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of of, uh, of asking why when I do things, and uh, I think it's kind of a, a deep need for a lot of folks. So, so I'm, I'm challenging our panelists to begin with, um, with this question. Uh, why the long trail? And what did you hope to gain from the experience? And did you succeed in, in, uh, in that, that goal? Um, so I thought we could uh, start at the far end with David and Vlad, and we kind of work our way this way. And feel free to discuss it in pairs, and feel free to discuss amongst yourselves as well as we make our way down. OK. Um, I'm going to answer your very philosophical question with a not very philosophical answer. Great. Um, <laughs> a colleague of mine at work uh, came back from hiking the long trail in the summer of 2017 and was so overflowing with like the enthusiasm and the life and you know the magic of that experience that I was just like oh my god I want that um, so it was envy you know <laughs> <laughs> it goes a long way right <laughs> um, so hearing hearing her stories and I guess the question I asked myself was like well why not um, and so I put the question to Vlad on a walk, um, not really expecting or knowing what his answer would be. And he was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I was delighted. And so we spent um, a long time planning, uh, starting in maybe like January. Um, and we'd spend uh, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, like once or twice a week uh, doing planning. Um, so yeah, that was nice. Cool. Um, so partially it was because my dad wanted to. <laughs> but I think a bigger reason was because I live in Vermont, right? And I had never gone into the wilderness for a long period of time. I, I never felt like I had, you know, had that Vermont spirit and went out there and, you know, have a connection with the trees and the plants and the animals. And I was kind of seeking that. So when my dad proposed the idea to me, I was all for it. Might have not seemed super enthusiastic by the way you portrayed it, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, also, I love my dad and I love spending time with him, and I thought it would be a great way to spend a month doing what he loves and what I learned to love. <laughs> 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 Over my time on the trail. So, yeah, I guess that's kind of my reason why. That's a really good reason. <laughs> okay, well, you made it really easy to follow you up. <laughs> that's, no, that's awesome. Um, I think my journey is kind of similar in some ways. Like, uh, I choose to be a Vermonter, and I love it here so much, and hiking is one of those things that it took me a little bit of time to find the fun in. Um, and I got to a place where I found it to be really fun. I was like, I should see what it's like in all the parts of the mountains. Um, and then I got this idea of hiking the long trail in my head, but was pretty nervous about doing it by myself. Um, so I was kind of in this holding pattern where I was waiting for somebody to come along that would want to hike it with me. And then I made the decision to hike it by myself. And then I met Monica, <laughs> and it was super fortuitous timing, um, and I couldn't have been happier to hike it with a partner and just have somebody to share the experience with and be like, is this real? Like, <laughs> is this really what we get to do uh, every day? And it was. 
can confirm that. Um, why the long trail? Yeah, I I chose to move to Vermont. I had been here for like three years and was falling in love with the state, but had gone out on a bunch of summit missions and hadn't really called the woods my home yet, kind of like what Vlad was saying. Um, and I, I wanted to see the whole state. I wanted to see the south all the way to Canada. Um, I wanted home to be on my back. I got on a couple smaller backpacking trips uh, and had that itch to see how far I could push it. Um, and it was, it, the, it was kind of an objective-based goal for me as well, but it was the perfect length. And I really felt like it was an awesome experiential time as well. Good, good journey in all those respects. Uh, <clears throat> my partner and I didn't start hiking until we were 60. And of course it was natural basically to go out our back door. Our first hike was up Hunger Mountain. And then we wanted to do all the summits. Uh, we loved the places that we saw in the forest and thought that it would be quite an adventure to discover more of them. We're both sort of project oriented, so the uh, concept of hiking to Canada really appealed to us, and um, we made it. Not once, but twice. <laughs> twice, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, kind of touching on um, something uh, you said, Liz, and I actually have a, a question for you. Did, Liz and Monica, did you meet on trail or did you meet beforehand and decide to hike together? Beforehand, but actually oh. not that far beforehand. Nice. <laughs> it okay. was like a year max, probably, about a year. Yeah. Okay. Um, but immediately, like, we're really good hiking partners. And uh, some of you might know, you can't share a tent with just anybody. <laughs> Especially when you're both really stinky. <laughs> <laughs> and we, it was really good uh, complimentary partnership and kind of knew that it would work out somehow. Cool. Well, that's um, how convenient. That's a perfect segue into my next question. <laughs> I love it. Um, and, which is, uh, I just want to note that, that everyone sitting up here uh, hiked with a partner uh, for their, their through hikes. Uh, also, they're all through hikers, I believe. Uh, there are no, no section hikers amongst uh, the panelists tonight. Um, but uh, going back to the, the partner idea, I'd love to to hear, uh, as someone who hikes alone a lot myself, I'd love to hear from you all um, if you felt the desire for alone time while spending so much time with a partner while out on trail, and, and how did you handle those those feelings uh, hiking in these partnerships? Um, and I thought we could start with Alan and, and work our way back. Um, I, I guess I wouldn't I wouldn't really think about time alone. You're um, really dependent on your partner on the trail for practical reasons and emotional reasons. I mean, it can get a little tight in the tent once in a while. <laughs> um, but we were extremely compatible. Um, not that there aren't uh, brief moments of friction on the trail, but we're also very aware that you can't let them go very far. Uh, you're, you're there to support each other, and that's probably the most important thing. Um, yeah, I never felt that I wanted to be more alone. Our, our hiking style was kind of do however you're feeling, and we had certain you know checkpoints. So we we spent some like good hours hiking apart sometimes, just because one person was feeling great and had fresh legs and was gonna charge up the mountain, and one person wanted to like charge down the mountain or take it easy on the way up. So. Um, we, I think communication was really key for that and um, had, had enough alone time. Um, had separate chores at, at camp, and, but um, Alan brought up a good point with the dependency. Like There was still only one tent. We had to end at the same place. <laughs> um, one stove, someone else had the food, someone else had the, you know, the sriracha. <laughs> so, <laughs> <It's key. laughs> Yeah, it was a really good, like, good experience sitting with a, a partner. But it'd be fun to do alone too, I think. Yeah, um, I think I, I agree totally <laughs> with what Monica's saying, and then also what Alan mentioned, like the level of communication that you're able to develop by having that sort of dependency, but also choice to be doing something like this together is really special, and I feel like the way that we were able to like, solve problems when they came up 
was just like really effective and kind um, and a skill that I think would be super beneficial to anyone in the front country or like in the real world. But, um, it was just really amazing to be able to experience that part of it. And then obviously there was some direct communication, but then that trust that if you need time to hike by yourself and hike your own hike, as they say, like we knew that that was okay. And it wasn't a personal thing. It was just like about the individual components of our journey. So, um, yeah. It was great. Yeah. Um, me and my dad don't think ever had any big fights at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I th think it was super beneficial hiking with a partner. I don't know what I would have done without one. Um, I picked his brain thoroughly for every single story he had to tell. The miles go by a lot faster if you're listening to a story. <laughs> <laughs> That's a um, I did contribute some. <laughs> but I have a lot less time on this earth to gather them. Um, hiking with a partner, I never really wanted alone time, but I feel like even if you are hiking right next to someone, you can be in your own space mentally. Sometimes we didn't talk for hours, and that was fine. We didn't have to be interacting at all times, and I think that provided me the ability to hike, be with someone 24-7 for a full month. Yeah, uh, ditto that. <laughs> um, I, I never had any desire for a long time. I loved having Vlad in my line of sight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I loved, you know, sleeping by his side for a month. And then when we got home and like he went into his room and slept there, it was like, this is weird. <laughs> 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 was when I felt alone. Um, Want to go hiking? I, <laughs> I dropped him off at Camp, Camp Abnaki one day, two days after we got back. And uh, like he went to play tetherball with somebody and like I, I felt like a jilted lover. I was like, oh, you know, was just like, he's OK without me. <laughs> um, so so yeah, uh, being alone was never an issue. Like you, you are alone out there. Um, you know, we, we definitely spent a, a couple days hiking with other people, but for the most part, you know, it's, it's you and your partner. And so, um, no, I never had the desire to find space. We, we would have different um, chores. And so, if, like, those moments of, like, quiet contemplation while I was filtering water were plenty sufficient. Nice. Awesome. Thank you all. Yeah. Um, Sounds great. Uh, I'd love to uh, start taking some questions from, from our audience. Um, as, as we begin to kind of get into this, uh, I'm also going to um, see if I can um, access questions from our online audience as well. So I might be back here a little bit, but I'll, I'll come back here. Um, one thing that, um, that I, I do ask of folks in the audience is when you ask a question, I would uh, you know, really appreciate it if you just stand up, say your name real quick, and then um, if you uh, are directing your question at a specific panelist, please make sure that's known. If you would like to hear from all of them, um, that's OK, too. Um, but in the interest of time and making sure we get through um, as many questions as possible, I may ask that we only you know, ask a couple of panelists for some questions. So with that all in mind, um, we have some questions from the audience. Dan, do you want to start us off? Yeah. Hey. Uh, hey everybody, my name is Dan. I guess uh, most of us have haven't met before. I'm uh, an entertainer from the from, uh, summer of 17. Um, everybody has incredible stories, and hiking the trail is absolutely an amazing, amazing thing. I think one thing that gets overlooked sometimes is that hiking the trail is something that is really extremely difficult to do. And I don't know that a lot of people talk about that very much. And I wonder if any of you would be willing to share, like, what did you feel like was your most difficult day out there? What was the biggest challenge, the toughest thing you faced when you were walking from Massachusetts to Canada or the other way around? Um, Monica and Liz, do you want to start off? Sure. Um, that is really very true. Um, and the valleys very cheesy, but the valleys made the peaks even even better for sure. Uh, there was a day 
in particular where like my stomach was upset. I think Liz's knee was hurt. We were both like crying. <laughs> <laughs> I miss my dog. <laughs> I didn't know how to get out of this mental rut because I was just like felt like I was in a green tunnel and I was I had a lot of steps in front of me and there was never a moment of wanting wanting to give up. It was just like how do I fix my brain back to the task at hand <laughs> and um, but I mean I guess other stimulation came in and I had to do what I had to do and um, you know I definitely communicated with Liz on that I read a little bit of my book that was one of my luxury items <laughs> and thought about like the next steps so um, there's definitely a couple of days like that or a couple hours in each day like that and there's no shame in that it's definitely part of it <laughs> yeah I think you know, to say that there's not a physical toll on your body would be dishonest. I mean, we, I think we're in pretty good shape going into it and had relatively light packs and we're pretty well prepared for what it was going to be like physically, but uh, my knee really hurt and I was eating six ibuprofen <laughs> a day like clockwork and I'm not a big medicine person and, you know, it, it, you're just you know it's not gonna last forever and you're making decisions like, okay, it's worth it. And then obviously you can take a rest day if that's something you need, but just, you know, checking in with your body and that part is, it can, it can be really hard and you wanna make sure you take care of yourself so you can finish it as well. That's a balance for sure. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Alan, you wanna jump in? Um. I think the most profound thing for me was that I had never been out in absolutely horrendous weather before. You know, you're always inside looking out at it thinking, boy, I'm glad I'm not out there. <laughs> uh, you know, that in conjunction with being on the trail, it's getting dark and all of a sudden the sky just totally opens up and in minutes you're just completely trashed looking for some place to stop. Uh, on the first hike, we dove off the trail in, on an embankment. I had to lash the tent to a tree to keep from sliding down the hill all night. We were miserable. Uh, so that uh, it combined with um, some of the things that um, go wrong. Uh, that first picture in the slideshow of the feet, those were mine. That was before they got bad. <laughs> Hiking in wet shoes for days on end is it, just impossible. Uh, I'm going to try waterproof socks next time and see if that's any help. But uh, when your feet get that bad, it is extremely painful and it's, it's quite a challenge to overcome that kind of constant pain mentally and just keep going. Yeah. Right David Blood, do you have a yeah. really difficult moments? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably my hardest moment was on day two. So it came pretty quickly. My body hadn't really acclimated to hiking. And it was supposed to be a shorter day than it was. It was supposed to be 11 miles. And I think we ended up doing 13. Um, because somehow numbers change on a map. <laughs> um, Somebody might have misread the map. <laughs> um, but the beginning and, you know, like everything was fine until the end. I think the last mile, maybe two miles, I don't know how much it was, but I think it was Route 9. We went straight down, we went straight up. Oh, true. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Uh, the, descent, yeah. <laughs> the descent was brutal on the knees, and you just took so much impact because I hadn't learned how to walk. I mean, <laughs> not in a literal sense, but I didn't know how to take the impact into my body. And then I was also not super like fit for climbing up, so I was in tears by the end of it, and I was just hating it. I was miserable. And I wanted to get off at that point. Like, I was just like, screw it, you know? <laughs> this is terrible. Um, but it definitely got a lot better, and I'm glad I stayed on. And I think 
that probably where you hurt your knee, and I'll let you talk about that. So, so my I, the two low points, one was day three uh, when I felt like my knee was going to give out, and so we took a half day off where basically I realized I couldn't go anymore without injuring myself, and so we camped, I don't know, 25, 30 feet from the trail, and it ended up being really good because then a, like, a really horrific thunderstorm came in and we already had the shelter up. Um, and then about midway through, maybe day 16, day 17, we were gonna slack pack, because that's what the cool AT hikers do. <laughs> and slack pack means um, you give basically like a support team your pack, and you take a little day pack or a butt pack, and you do high miles. And so we were gonna be ambitious, starting in Stowe, and go um, up to Johnson, like 22, 23 miles. Um, Oh no, okay, I'm sorry, we're starting at route two. Uh, we got three miles in and I pulled my calf muscle. Cause, Cause we were going fast, you know? Yeah. And it was, it was a different pace than we were used to and that was enough to injure myself. Um, so I took, we took a day and a half off back at the house. It, again, it was sort of fortunate because it was right in the middle of a heat wave. And so rather than being out on the trail, we were at home a lot, swimming a lot for that day and a half. And I, didn't, I really thought we weren't going to get back on the trail. We'd been waking up so early with the sun that I woke up at like 4.30 after that day and a half. And I was like, screw it. Like, let, let's go back. We've got to try it. And, um, and we did. And, it, you know, I was taking baby steps to get back up on the trail. And we just kept on going. Yeah. Wow, low points. Um, before we move on to our next question, I, uh, you jogged my memory, David, um, with uh, the heat wave comment. So last July, um, um, if, if you were here in Vermont or anywhere in New England, you probably remember that, uh, that period in July. And that was at the, the end of a really long drought period here, um, so much so that water became a really difficult thing to find on the trail. And, um, and I, I Got a couple questions from folks in emails before the panel asking specifically about water, and I know some folks might have that on the mind. So um, I'd love to just hear a couple thoughts about your experiences finding water on the trail, how often you could, um, you know, how good the sources were. You know, and I guess it all depends on when you were there, but um, you know, if you were there at different times, we might have some some different perspectives. So. Okay. Liz, you want to so take Monica it away? So and I hiked July one till July twenty fourth. So we rain. got rained on one and a quarter times. Wow. So we kind of had the opposite experience of you, Alan, <laughs> which made packing really great. Um, but the average temperature was like 75 degrees. Um, and it was really a little bit sketchy finding water towards the very end. Uh, luckily, there's people who care about through hikers and in some places, People had hiked in five gallon jugs and left them at the shelters, but we uh, we have a gravity filter. So it was the two of us and we were also originally gonna bring our dogs and we pulled the plug on that because of the temperature. Um, so we had a gravity filter to filter um, two liter or a liter of water at a time, two liters of water at a time. I think it was two, yeah. Yeah, so Big. pretty quickly for a lot of people uh, and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there would be places where it would be really hard to just fill up, and that was scary. So then sometimes we would also double up on purification if we were drinking from pretty gross puddles. So gravity filter it and then put in iodine or sanitation tablets. And was really thankful for our filter. Uh, it was one of the most efficient, definitely the most efficient I've, I've ever used. And that actually peace of mind getting from putting tablets in the water as well. We also got a lot of beta from people coming on the trail too. Like wasn't afraid to speak up and be like, where's the last place you got water? Um, and let them know the same as well. Um, cool. Just if you know this can be a dry spell, we had plenty of vessels that we were gonna load up on too. Um, yeah, I know Nalgene's aren't the lightest thing, but it's worth it to have <laughs> that, not, not skimp it on water. Cool. Uh, what was the uh, manufacturer of that filter, just so folks know? I can, let me pull it up. <laughs> I think it's platypus. I think it's platypus. It, it platypus? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so something to keep in mind. Um, yeah. 
it was really dry then. Uh, Alan, did you have any issues with water? Well, the, <coughs> other than it on your skin. The first hike, it, it rained 25 out of 27 days. So that was a really wet trip. When did you do it? Was it summer? It was um, July mm -hmm. in 213. Um, but there are places on the trail where it's almost always dry along the Monroe skyline. Water is limited. And you always have to be aware of um, how far you're going to go that day and where you think the water sources are. Sometimes the sources at the shelters are sketchy. Um, so we would always try to load up midday so that we would have something for dinner and hopefully a little leftover for breakfast if when we got to our end point that day there was nothing. So we pretty much are always carrying each at least a liter of water. Gotcha. Yeah. David and Vlad, what was your water experience? Um, I was carrying a, a three liter uh, plastic platypus, well, I don't know what it's called, plastic bag that held water. Um, <laughs> Vlad had two liters, and my resource uh, was really Vlad because he wouldn't drink any water. <laughs> And so I would finish my container, and then I'd be drinking from his. Um, which meant that I was stopping to pee 20 times a day, and he was like, a lot less than that. Um, uh, so for, for our water, our experience was very similar. I think it just bears calling out Trail Granny, who was um, close to Killington, a little bit north of there, which was one of the few dry shelters where we were. And um, she'd written in, you know, that, that she was there, and there was a, a, a six-gallon container. She'd made three trips to fill it up. Wow. And, and, and it was critical and wonderful and blew us away. Wow. That's wild. Very cool. All right. Um, let's uh, move on to another question from the audience. Yes. Um, I'm Ryan. Um, one of the questions I have is you mentioned preparing and planning. We were planning on just showing up. <laughs> <laughs> what, what kind of planning did you do other than we want to do this amount per day and this is what we're bringing with us? Yeah. So um, my experience prior to hiking the long trail was primarily a, a semester in the Rockies with National Outdoor Leadership School. And, and that's like very expedition oriented and expedition planning. And so that was sort of my attitude going in that we were going to calculate the, <laughs> the weight of the food that we were gonna eat every day and we were gonna buy those amounts. Um, and, and it was fun as if like an academic exercise. <laughs> useful in terms of what we actually ended up eating um, because I, I was I don't know I was planning basically a winter hiking trip um, and so it was like super heavy-duty cooked breakfast super heavy-duty cooked meals and you know a, a handful of snacks for the day and that was totally the wrong ratio um, and so we had too much food after we had um, I can't remember if it was oatmeal or one of the dry cereals after the first day, like that was the last time we ate it the entire time that we were there and we had like 12 pounds of it. Um, so, so we actually, uh, we dropped a ton of food on day two because we had too much. So you can speak to snacks. Yeah, <laughs> snacks, they're key, like vital. I would not eat that much breakfast or dinner and I would just eat like 30 bars a day. I ate a ton of snacks. I think they were got me through it. I had like a pop tart in the morning and a little bit of dinner, but I think snacks were very key. Um, at the beginning, we had like an allotment that looked like a lot when we were planning. Like we had like three bars and some like you know small like granola or something, and. I blew through it <laughs> the first time we stopped and I was hungry. I ate his snacks. Um, Sounds like a good trade, food for yeah. water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ultimately, we were filling up gallon bag 
gallon plastic bags of snacks and he would have one for the day and I would have one for the day. I mean, that, that was the quantity of snacks. And that, it was just so much more gratifying to be able to, you know, eat and look forward to snacks as, over the course of the day rather than like some big meal or big breakfast. Yeah, uh, I got myself some candy. <laughs> and I would plan it out. I would be like, once I get here, I'm allowed to have this much candy. And once I get to the end point, I'm allowed to have that much. And that would motivate no. me. Um, That's very familiar. I would, <laughs> yeah, I would <laughs> force myself to keep going because I'll be like, I got some airheads. I'm going to get them. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not like what got me through it, but that's what helped me get over those rough stretches where you're just going up and down and it seems endless. And yeah, I think that was super key. And the food that we did bring seemed to go on forever. It was like an infinite bag. You would like pour yourself a meal and that would be like too much. And you still have like three quarters of the bag left. And it's supposed to be like a meal for one person for one day. And it ended up going for both of us for like two days. So that was a big surprise. And a little bit more about his experience at Knowles. I guess they did lower mileage yeah. each day. So they had heavier packs. So we ended up going with way too heavy packs. Um, we had advice that like cut down your pack as, like, the, as light as possible, that's the best. And we didn't really take it to heart as much as we should have. We definitely should have cut down on weight and food. And like week two, two and three, we definitely got it down a lot lower, which was way better. How much did your packs weigh? Um, the first week, mine was 35. And mine was closer to 50. It was, oh, yeah, so, so I, the Knowles way. <laughs> I, I, I would focus on like the weight of your pack for your planning and focus on your resupply points. And then other, other than that, like you don't have to go to town. Cool. Yeah. Rapid fire real quick before we move on. Um, if you know your pack weights starting out, let's hear them. So 50, 35. I think 35. I think it was 35, yeah. 32. Okay. Wow. Gotcha. Cool. But with planning, like the biggest thing is the resupply. Yeah. Um, you know, we were lucky enough to live in Vermont and have people who wanted to support us. <laughs> like, yeah. add that we're, it's a bunch of road crossings. You could definitely do it unsupported and hitch into town and resupply. Um, but we had boxes that were, um, we gave to people, willing volunteers that um, like brought their cars to some road crossings. We ditched stuff, took stuff, mostly food. Yeah. Um, I will put a shameless plug for us when we break into small groups. If you're interested in super delicious menu planning, like if you care what you eat on the channel, <laughs> I would say that's one of our specialties. Some people are cool with nor oh, pasta sides every day or pop tarts, but like <laughs> at everywhere we went, people were all, like, always commenting gourmet. on the food. Um, so that would be something we'd be happy to share in that breakout time. I even brought a little bit of food. <laughs> <laughs> Not cooked yet, no. <laughs> Just ideas. Speaking of that, I think, uh, Ellen, you're, you're, a, you're a food aficionado as well, right? I, I think when you're on the trail, it's probably the most common thing that's on your mind. Yes. <laughs> so uh, it, it's really important to bring food that it supports you know, your body and that you want to eat. Um, yeah, so in, in planning, um, Morgan and I did the same thing that Monica and Elise did in terms of having family meet us, and I had to plan out how many days I thought it would take us, how much food I'd need to each resupply. We had four resupplies, uh, three of them at road crossings, and that, that pretty well worked out. How many resupplies did you guys have? I think probably four. Maybe six. Maybe six. <laughs> so we got lucky too because people wanted to hike with us. Um, so our friends came and joined us. And so sometimes it was literally like one day. Like yeah, they like bring us like two like dinners. <laughs> at Camel Sound, like having beer, you know, people like just met us and hung out. So it wasn't a super structured resupply, and a lot of it was cell phone communication saying, we're faster, we're slower, um, we forgot toothpaste. <laughs> we need so much more toilet paper. <laughs> we, we planned three resupplies, and so like seven days in between resupplies, and that was too long, and that was mm -hmm. one of the reasons we were carrying too much weight. Yeah. So I would definitely recommend doing a minimum of I four. think we carried like three or four days max, yep. and that's plenty. We, we ate a lot. Snacks keep you happy. Yeah. <laughs> and going, so. Nice. Yeah. 
Um, I believe you had a question earlier. Do you, you still have one? I have two quick questions. Yeah. You know, I, I wear a size nine boot, and um, I've been told that you should really maybe go up a half a size or so uh, in, mm. in your boots. And so I'm kind of curious about your thought. I mean, I've never had trouble, but I have never hiked 25 days or whatever it may be. Um, you know, so that was one question. And other people who have hiked that I've spoken to, I'm Diane, um, <laughs> and I live here, close by, um, is that they said, oh, well, you should really just hike from hot to hot. Yeah. Mm. And I, I hadn't really thought about that. I thought, oh, well, some, you know, if you have good legs one day, why not put in a few more miles and park yourself somewhere? But what, it, it, so I'm interested in that. That, to me, is a big question. Cool. Great. All right, so uh, let's let's tackle the the shoe size first. Uh, panelists, raise your hand if you went up a shoe size or half a size. For your hike. All right, raise your hand if you kept your normal size. All right, so okay. even split. Maybe. Yeah. Better or worse? Uh, yeah. Did, uh, were there any size. major issues with with either of those? I never had problems with my shoes. I think they were great. I wore trail runners. I didn't wear big bulky boots. Hmm. Yeah, I think that was an interesting game time decision. If so I was an avid boot hiker and I switched to trail runners and I was really happy to be in trail runners. I wore what I'm wearing right now, which are trail runners. <laughs> um, Did you skate with the trail runners? No. It was so dry when we were. Oh yeah, trail. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we uh, well, when I came to this last year, I was planning on wearing a big bulky boot and then after talking to the panelists and Vlad working on me, uh, <laughs> finally decided to wear trail runners and was really, really pleased I'd made wow. that decision. And and ended up um, and we wore uh, gaiters. Gotcha. I've had my feet look like Alan did in that picture <laughs> in big boots and I was like, that's what I want to avoid. Yep. So trail runners dry out really fast. Um, you can roll your ankle in a big boot and in a trail runner. So and you get a little bit more support when it's higher, but um, I found that being in shape is the be best prevention for injury. Awesome. And uh, the second part of that question, um, what do you think about hiking shelter to shelter, especially on the long trail? As, as I understand it, they're, they're closer together on the long trails than they would be, say, in a you know, hut system in Europe or hut system in the White Mountains. So, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on um, hiking shelter to shelter? Alan, do you have anything? Yeah, well, the, the distances between the shelters um, seldom work out with your motivation for the day. <laughs> and you know, it, <laughs> it, it could be difficult to um, try to plan shelter to shelter. Not that it can't be done, but often you would probably be stretching yourself a lot of days and then be really short a lot of days because you'd have to double your mileage in order to hit shelter to shelter. So we pretty much hike till we're tired. And if there's a shelter within reach and there's tenting at that shelter, that would be our best choice because we prefer to tent than sleep in the shelters. It's a lot quieter. There's less bugs in the tent. <laughs> um, yeah, that's about it. Cool. Yeah. Do you have any other thoughts about shelters? Yeah, definitely. Um, so me and my dad mainly hiked shelter for shelter. We didn't really just camp wherever normally unless there was something came up or like we just couldn't. Do it was it an emergency something. basically. Mm, yeah. Gotcha. Um, I definitely see what you're talking about. It was hard to plan. Like some days we'd end up doing way more than another day because the shelters just wouldn't work out. They're not like set distances. They're kind of scattered and you got like two mile shelters apart and then you got like six miles or something like that. And that was harder. I think we probably should have taken up the opportunity just to camp wherever um, because it did end up with some harder days that were like we shouldn't have done and some totally easy ones that we also had a lot more energy. And yeah, I definitely, we kept going if we could, if it was like within reach, like if we got to a shelter and we still had four miles to the next shelter, we would keep going. But we would also always debate it and, you know, see what our bodies wanted to do. And if we knew we could do it, but I think we would probably 
usually be on the safer side because I get the repercussion for not having those four miles, I think is a lot more impactful than the gain of doing those four miles. I thought it was really easy to go shelter to shelter. Yeah. And we, we, we really enjoyed the planning part of that, like the piecing out the miles so that it worked out. It's kind of a puzzle you have to piece together. Um, shelters typically have the best already cleared out tent areas, best, most reliable water sources, a privy. Um, so we didn't sleep in the shelter hardly ever, but um, having those amenities basically, um, <laughs> Yeah. Very <laughs> yeah. Luxurious <laughs> babies. I guess if you're a leave no trace person, that would say that you'd want to camp at the shelter too because then you're minimizing your impact. It, it also allows you to conserve time and energy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there'd be more work uh, in digging a cat hole or there'd be more work in setting up your tent yeah. in, in some place. And mm -hmm. so you can focus on resting. Um, and hiking. Nice. Yeah. Can I just, uh, before we get off the tent, how do you pick your tent spot or what made you decide where to go? Or, you know, like I've, I've only done shelter to shelter, and so I was kind of curious about what is involved in the tenting side of the hike. Tents these days have really small footprints, so you can pitch them uh, in a pretty small area. Uh, we just learned what kind of routes we could handle sleeping on and what we couldn't, basically. Um, having an air. Trail or? Uh, well, if it's at a shelter area, it's typically like a couple tents off the trail maximum, um, but in a pretty designated tent area. If you're tenting, uh, you know, just in a, a stealth site or a primitive site, um, I don't know. It's. You don't want to be making a lot more trails in the woods, but I also prefer it would be a little bit more private, you know. Mm -hmm. Also just as like a small female in the woods alone. Well, not alone, but two small females in the woods. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. That answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Cool. There is this thing called gut hook that a lot of people use. We didn't use it. It's an app. It's, I think it was more popular on the Appalachian Trail, but people could put on stealth sites and say, and add that water feedback. And it's sort of, I think, kind of this live blog where you can add information um, about what's going on on the trail. So that's how people would find out like, oh, there's a great stealth site that's actually really cool next to this stream in okay. Big Branch. Mm -hmm. um, what was it called? I think it's called Gut Hook, Gut right? Hook, yeah. It's like yeah. crowdsourced yeah. from hikers yeah. real time, pretty much. So a stealth site is just kind of like, off into the woods and you're like, this is flat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You, you learn to read the maps and, and often look for areas where the contours aren't changing, which are often either side of road crossings and, and here, there, and everywhere. In terms of anticipating them, that's going to be a good place to stop. And then you just start looking about an hour before you really want to stop. That's a great point. You don't look oh. when you want to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Because it could be a place where it's totally overgrown with like prickers, <laughs> and you're like, I have to walk until the prickers end, basically. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important to know that in, in terms of stealth sites and, and campsites in general, um, uh, Green Mountain Club uh, obviously promotes Sleep No Trace, and there are some guidelines on their website for for choosing a campsite on trail uh, in a sustainable Leave No Trace way. Um, and I'd be happy to chat with anyone about that afterward as well. Um, yeah, choosing a place that's already pre-impacted is really helpful. The Long Trail sees nearly 200,000 annual users. Not all of those are camping, but you get the gist. So yeah, something to think about with, uh, with stealth sites in particular. Um, I wanted to uh, take a moment and uh, pose a few questions from our online community. Um, they are hitting us with lots of questions, so our YouTube stream must be working really well. Um, so <laughs> it's great. There's a whole wide world out there that wants to, to know some things. Um, I'm going to start with a question that at least three people online have asked, which is um, they want to know some things about bear bags. Mm -hmm. So um, bear systems, let's hear it. What do you do for bears? How do you store your food at night? Um, Alan, let's start with you because I know you have evolved your system over the years. I've been, I've been around Robinson Barn on this a lot of times. <laughs> um, 
I, I do carry what's called an ERSAC, which is a Kevlar fabric bag. It's not, um, it's not bear proof, but it is critter proof. And actually the squirrels and mice are, are your main problem. But as far as bears go, you need to do a hang. Um, and um, there are seldom proper trees <laughs> where, wherever you are camping. Um, and that includes the shelters where you can do a proper bear hang, which in my understanding is supposed to be 10 feet up and 10 feet out. Um, I have hit myself in the head throwing rocks <laughs> over trees and just about driven myself crazy doing bear hangs. But I also learned that I'm usually trying to throw a rock over a branch that's about 25 or 30 feet in the air because that's all there is. So um, I have sort of reduced um, my uh, anticipation of doing proper bear hangs to the point that I've realized that something is better than nothing. Just get it away from you wherever you're camping. And I realized that if I can find a dead branch with a fork on the end, I can actually reach a branch in a tree that's about 15 feet up, or I can lash my hiking poles together and just drop the little rock over the branch instead of standing around for half an hour trying to lob it over the branch, which I'm not very good at. That's awesome. Excellent. We used uh, these heavy duty plastic sacks, which are not bear proof, but supposedly they were scent proof. Um, and so we would put all of our, you know, toothpaste and food um, in these two very large plastic bags, then throw them in these cheap nylon um, shopping bags, put a beaner on it and, and hang those. You know, we, we never had any issues. Uh, you'll also see these little things hanging in the shelters, uh, a twig on a string with a coffee can uh, inverted over it, and that's a critter hang. Um, and so if you do have anything smelly or, or food, uh, or actually not even that, just your gear, like putting your um, backpack on it so that um, the mice aren't eating through your backpack, um, we learned it was really good to get all of our gear off the floor. Yeah, we never had any direct problems with bears or anything like that. The funny thing that I found at one shelter, I don't remember which one it was, but they had a barricade. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Like, like a bear. fence sort of thing? It or? was a barricade oh. that said bear, a cade on it. Oh. I thought that was hilarious. I laughed for like two straight minutes. <laughs> It, oh, it's yeah. a two by four on yeah on the it's door that locks into place. Yeah, apparently a bear actually got yeah. in there, <laughs> and that's yeah. And then on the other side of the mountain, and I was like, who put the barricade there? And she was like, that was me. I did that, and so she told us the whole story. But yeah, the barricade was a highlight. We loved it. I it. <laughs> yeah, that was super funny. That was just the, the, kind of my only experience with bears. That was as close as we got to bears. Excellent. That's good. Was it Monica? What did y'all do? We for did bears? the tie a rock to a string and throw it over a branch and then hoist it up. No. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's critters. You, you know, and I think it, there's always lots of good communication amongst the hikers and the journals and in person. Yep. Um, so, like, if there's a bear in a place, you're probably going to hear about it. Unless you're the one who discovers it. <laughs> <laughs> the Another discoverer. thing with uh, going where the shelters are is there will be other people there usually, and they've already hung their bags, and you can typically use the same branch, uh, unless you're going to knock their bags over. But so, you know. Strength. Yeah, really we've, had, we've had hikers be like, just clip yours to my carabiner. It's strong enough. It's fine. And then, you know, you pay that forward, too, if you end up finding a good, a good uh, limb on a tree at the next shelter. I actually have. I'll get it out. <laughs> um, while, while she's doing that, I um, want to make a note about the, the critter hangs that, that David and Vlad mentioned. I, uh, I hung my stuff uh, from one in David Logan's shelter, and somehow the critters still found it. So um, when possible, the bear bag is definitely the um, in, in, our, in my experience, the, the more foolproof way. The, the critter hangs will do some for you, but may not ultimately protect you. We pretty much used this bag, which is just a dry sack, nothing fancy, and hung it with some P cord. Yeah. 
Ta-da! So I can rope. Keep it simple, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is ultra light. Right on. Um, sweet. Bears. Always fun. Um, also, in a few sites in the south, there are bear boxes, too, that have been packed in uh, by staff or volunteers. And so if you see a bear box, that's easier and safer than a bear hang. So that's always your, your number one, then the bear hang, then hopefully you can do one of those. Um, another uh, question I'm getting online a lot and was touched on earlier was resupplies. Resupply is a, is a recurring theme. Um, so just wanted to, um, to kind of revisit that again. Uh, someone online asked, uh, what are the best resupply towns? And um, you know, assuming you went into town to resupply, um, what are some of the towns that stick out in your minds? And if you didn't, then that's fine too. So we were, we were hiking with a pretty solid group at some points, and some of our hiking buddies did have to go hitch into town to resupply. Um, yeah. But we were pretty, had the luxury of <laughs> not having to do that. Yeah, I would say when the LT and the AT are the same, um, all the major road crossings, a lot of people are coming off because the AT people are getting resupplied. Then as you get up further north, it gets definitely a little bit quieter. Um, crossing Route 2, it's a little bit far to get to the nearest grocery store, but people also know that that's where the long trail is and there's a fair amount of traffic on Route 2. So if you're out there with your backpack on, somebody will pick you up and drive you to the grocery store. If you need to go to the grocery store and there's a post office there that I think services packages if you're mailing to yourself. And then Johnson is the other big one as you're getting closer to Canada. Um, there's a gear slash convenience slash coffee store um, that is supposed to be a good spot for resupplies as well. And it's another kind of big road where you have a pretty good chance of getting picked up if you're hitching to that. If folks are coming from out of state, um, you know, they might see Jonesville on the map and be like, I'm going to Jonesville for my resupply. Uh, so that's not a place you can do that. <laughs> that's where I live. There's nothing there. <laughs> yeah. uh, you're going to have to go to um, Richmond or, I guess, to Waterbury. Yeah. Um, yeah. Two memorable uh, towns for us were Manchester and Waitsfield. O originally, I was planning to have like friends of the family and colleagues do our resupplies, <laughs> but after our first resupply, uh, where my wife and younger son met us, and we went into town, and we brought our clothes to the laundromat, and we hit the supermarket, and we went to a restaurant and got cheeseburgers. It was like, this is how I want to do it from now on. So I fired my friends and <laughs> colleagues and just asked my lovely wife um, to, to meet us for the remainder of, and, and like that was a highlight of hiking the long trail too. Like our town days were so much fun. We are in Waitsfield and next to the laundromat, there's a Vermont fish place. And she told us about the local swimming hole. And so we spent the afternoon at the local swimming hole and it was, you know, it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, so on the resupply days, we had super low mileage, like only like four miles or five, like to the just near a shelter, basically. And we would do it like an old day, old day kind of event, which is, I mean, if you're going to do a lot of them, I don't think that's an option. But since we only did three, that was easier for us. It. I mean, we spent money that we weren't planning to. We would go into a supermarket and buy a bunch of snack food and a bunch of other stuff that we weren't playing. <laughs> kind of candy too, but we don't talk about the candy bar. Um, I overate one of them and I had a terrible stomach ache because I was just like, burger, get it into my belly. <laughs> Same thing, it's like shoveling food into my face. Um, it's not a good strategy. My stomach was accustomed to like not having a ton of food and it was not very good. I didn't even want to look at food, so it was hard to tell my father to plan what we wanted because I was just like, I don't want any of it. <laughs> don't overdo it. Yeah. On, on our hike, we did not get off the trail except for hiking the one mile up to the Inn at Long Trail where you can leave a resupply box and you can spend uh, some great time there in their pub. And uh, 
it, most people can get a room there. They have a, a reduced rate for hikers, so it's a great place to stay. Um, but I, I actually found that even road crossings were sort of disruptive to my state of mind. We just wanted to be in the forest. Um, it was great, though, to go to the end of Long Trail. Yeah. So did you carry, like, 100 plus miles worth of food? No, we, oh. we got resupplied at road crossings oh, okay. three other times. But okay. you didn't with go into boxes. town. Okay. Mm. But you didn't go into town. No, we never yeah. went into town. Gotcha. So you had a support crew. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Excellent. Where is it? Um, it's, it's near Killington on Route 4. You come down off of Killington if you're going north. It's right at the junction where the AT turns off. So it's yeah. kind of like a big spot. Yeah. yeah. The, the so food is good. Sure. Yeah. Like cool. Beer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. The, uh, the end to enders guide actually has a couple of things you wouldn't expect as far as resupply. Those towns are really great. Um, one of them is like, for example, uh, the ski patrol office uh, at Stratton Mountain, which has people in it all year round. Like they'll take a box for you. If you want to mail it to them. Uh, they're listed in the book as a source. And so I called them up and I said, you know, it's a spike. Can I send you a box? And she said, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I sent the box to Stratton Mountain, uh, went down the mountain, picked it up, went back up the mountain. We went out our way. Uh, so it's not always necessarily a town. If you have certain resorts or other places around, uh, they're, they're all listed in that guide. And some of them are places you might not expect to definitely check them out. Sweet. Yes, questions. Yeah. Um, what was the clothes washing slash change of clothes? <laughs> <laughs> Style. Nice. Clothes washing is like a change of clothes. All right, this, I love clothing questions. <laughs> we had that really hot spell. So everything was completely sweaty. There was no point in keeping it not sweaty and clean. So had clean, dry for sleep, and then back to the still soaking wet, dirty for hiking. Yeah. Even underwear? Uh, I think I probably used three pairs of underwear. We turn them inside out. <laughs> and then get the shorts to have underwear too. <laughs> you, you can plan on getting pretty stinky. Yeah. Uh, you can do laundry at the end of Long Trail. Mm -hmm. but people who get off the trail often find the laundromat, but basically you just get used to it. It was so cold on our second hike that I uh, just slept in all my clothes. I didn't change. I put on my rain gear at night. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, cold. If you. Uh, creeks you can do yeah, we a just, quick rinse in, which is pretty helpful for getting just like salty sweat off. Yeah. Clarendon Gorge mm -hmm. and um, Big Branch mm -hmm. were two that come to mind. Mm -hmm. What do you guys recommend for like how many pairs and like type of socks to bring? Mm -hmm. yeah. on a hike Gotta go with the darn toughs. <laughs> Yeah, I would wear a pair of socks uh, and get a new pair between each resupply, so five days maybe, and they're, they're pretty ripe after five days. <laughs> they just hold their shape really well. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to only have one luxury item, but having a lot of socks was one of my luxury items because I've personally found that like my feet get really sweaty and then the salt makes the little crystals and that is a source of blisters for me. So I was like two or three days in a pair of socks and then I would switch like which ones were sleep ones and which ones were day ones so that you know I could sleep in dirty ones and have clean ones for hiking um, but I would just do a little bit of hiking in dirty socks maybe to see how your feet handle it because that was personally something I knew could be an issue. Cool. David, what were your, uh, your clothing and sock uh, strategies? I, I, same deal like you minimize the amount of clothes that you bring and it ends up being the clothes that you have in camp and the clothes that you have on, on the trail and sometimes those are even the same thing. I had dual purpose for the socks. Um, the, you know, the nasty pair that I didn't want to put on my feet anymore, I would wear underneath my shoulder straps on my um, backpack because I was starting to get um, some pretty brutal abrasions here. Cool. Liz used duct tape for that <laughs> instead. So we have duct tape all over our bodies. <laughs> it's great for blisters of all kinds yeah. and something you can uh, wrap around your trekking pole. Um, that's another gear gear tip. That way you have it. 
Yeah, there's some trekking poles with, 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 with the duct tape, and it's black. It's under yeah. There. On that note, I had thought I was fine hiking without trekking poles, but was really glad I brought them. Especially for descents, you have like two extra legs that can help stabilize you. Cool. I, I can't like reinforce that enough. Uh, we started off, I think, with one pair, and we it was clear we needed that. Too. Um, let's take your question, then we're going to go to a couple good ones online as well. So let's start How with you. How do you guys use like cell phones on the trail? I've noticed in the Green Mountains, you have service just about everywhere, and then oh, that I've been, and then, like you guys mentioned, gut or whatever. Yeah. Um, I would, you know, yeah go ahead. I wasn't on between the two of us. We tried to keep one on, I think, or like I don't know. I, we weren't on it that much, and didn't really have to recharge it. Uh, kept it on airplane mode. There are some dead zones that are pretty lengthy, maybe a day or two, um, but wasn't relying on that for intel or communication unless we knew we were getting to a road where we needed to talk to our people. Yep. We use them for photos too. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't take much battery or service. Yeah. yeah, you often won't find service except on the high points. Uh, and when you're deep in the wilderness, you won't find service. But um, because we were going to be met at road crossings, we could often find a place the day before to contact people. We did um, run down the battery on the phone the first time about halfway through, and somebody brought us a fresh one. And then the second time, I got one of these little super battery that you can recharge with, and that worked fine. It's just a, a little bit extra weight. So we brought just a little flip phone. Yeah, we have it this nice. right here. Oh, cool. Wow, they still exist. <laughs> they still Wonderful. exist. They're 35 bucks at CVS. Come on, right now. Bye, y'all. <laughs> yeah. We mainly used it for like, if we figured something out that we wanted for our resupply while we were on the trail, we All would it. use it to <laughs> contact my mom to get it to bring it, that thing for us. Um, we also had it for emergencies, obviously. Luckily, we didn't have to use it, I don't know, maybe once, zero. Um, but I think it's definitely great to have. We didn't take any pictures well, like, in the forest, which I kind of forgot a little bit. I think if you have the ability to take photos, it's definitely a good idea. I really like not having, uh, like, the smartphone um, with us. The, the lack of electronics was one of the beauties of being out there. There were some AT hikers who um, spent a lot of time on their phones uh, in, in the shelters, and, and that was kind of a turnoff um, to me because it's just like a wonderful time to spend, um, to meet people and talk. So I, I, I was really psyched with this solution. Um, the battery lasted a full week, uh, no problem. We, you know, we texted what we needed, but, but that was it. And um, we kept it off most of the time because we didn't want to have access to the time of day. Um, ah. it, because that, that was a real like mental health burden if we knew what time it was. Um, so yeah. I think we checked the weather a yeah. couple times because we were trapped on top of a mountain in a thunderstorm and we wanted to see the radar if it was yeah. gonna pass. Yeah. And that's good stuff to know, you know, if it's going to storm or mm -hmm. what you're looking at. Yeah, we were definitely milking other people for information about me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were taking advantage of their cell phones. Yeah. <laughs> nice. yeah, so if you're doing it by yourself and plan to have a pretty solitary hike, it might be good to have a backup charge. Great. Um, so a uh, quick question from the internet. Uh, this comes from Miss Fizzle. Uh, for the ladies, I had a friend suggest not bringing a tent, but I'm worried about A, lean-tos being full, and or B, sketchy people at the camp and wanting the flexibility to sleep on my own. Thoughts? Yeah, we, we had one, we approached one shelter that we didn't want to stay in. It didn't, it looked like someone had been there, someone maybe living there. Uh, there was trash that we didn't want to, we weren't, a, weren't able to pack out and we thought was not, not sitting right with us and, you know, like, that's something we were pretty aware of. Luckily, like, having two minds on it, 
was good. It probably would have made me really nervous if I didn't like wasn't able to say to Liz, is this a good idea? Is this not? Am I being crazy? <laughs> Am I being not crazy enough? Yeah. Um, and you, I don't think we ever really got close to being in a shelter that was full. There's definitely more people in the AT section, um, but it is, it's just kind of nice to have your tent as personal space. Um, we did get matching pepper sprays on Amazon before we went. Um, so I would highly recommend that. Uh, it just brought a little bit of extra peace of mind and because there are times when it's not ideal. But. I felt very safe in general, but um, I think part of that came from like having, having the tent. So, um. Cool. Uh, when folks um, uh, hear the, the AT section of the long trail, are we all on the same page? Where that is the southern 100 miles. So um, when the AT either, you know, it's, it's a long, long trail and then departs or vice versa, then it gets a lot busier in that section. So, yes. Uh, hi, I'm Katie. I have two questions, one for everyone. Did you do northbound or southbound? And if you were doing that, did you catch wind of anyone else being like, oh, the other way is awesome, sucks. And then my second question is also again for the ladies, because I just really want to know. <laughs> um, and I feel like some of us might want to know. I've never been hiking for so many days when it's my time of the month. <laughs> so I want to know what you did with that, how you trashed it, how you didn't, or if you used a different method. Sure. All right, so let's, uh, let's do a quick Nobo Sobo, so northbound and southbound. Raise your hands. Uh, who went northbound? Okay. Everybody. <laughs> did, you, did you hear from anyone that southbound was better or northbound was better or anything? Any opinions out there on the trail? For us, it was like the southern part of the state is intermediate difficulty. The northern part of the state is advanced. And we needed to start on the easier side of things. Nice. Yeah, and you also have access to the AT hikers. I think it's really good to pick up wisdom and advice from them because they have been doing it for a long time and have a lot of experience. And I think that definitely helped us to know what we needed on the trail. Yeah. For us, I think it worked out really nicely going northbound because we went straight through to Route 2 because uh, we both live here. Um, and then we slowed down because we were like, we're going too fast. And yeah. it was cool to be able to slow down in the north and also really helpful because it is harder. <laughs> but we were like, we want to really enjoy being here for the last end of the trail. I liked going north for the same reasons that the more rugged mountains are in the north, which are more enjoyable for me. So that was such a pleasure having that. And it, um, if you went south, you would be cruising in the southern third of the of the hike. And I would love to try going south as well. Uh, we we heard a lot of comments that when we hit um, Mansfield and beyond, it it was going to be much much harder. And we didn't really feel that was true. By that time, we were harder ourselves. Right. Yeah. We did slow down some. Um, but we were really focused on getting to Canada. And you sort of get an adrenaline rush when you realize you're five days out. You're not going to stop. <laughs> but next time, we're going to go in the other direction just to do it differently, the whole new trail. When's next time? When's next time? Mm -hmm. This fall. Woo! Wow. Wow. Right. For number three. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Alex. Right on. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, Liz and uh, Monica, you want to take away with the feminine needs? My time of the month timed itself perfectly to not really affect me, but we were prepared. Um, and I wouldn't have felt good about doing anything besides packing it in and packing it out, just having a separate plastic bag and not leaving a trace of that ever happening. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, for me, I would, well, I relied on Tums and Alka-Seltzer as it was, and she relied on ibuprofen, and I would probably need some more of those things if that had been a factor, too. Um, <laughs> to be honest. I got a surprise on the trail. <laughs> but, I mean, obviously, you're prepared, and pack, 
pack it out in a separate little plastic bag. And I'm a big fan of applicator-free tampons in the first place, so that wasn't a big switch. Um, but if you're comfortable with those, I would suggest it because then you just have all that min more minimal waste. Um, but I, and swimming wise, like hygiene, I feel like, you know, you don't want to take a bath in the water source, but you could definitely bring a bandana and get it wet and, you know, clean yourself up a little bit without contaminating There's the water. Dr. And, Bronner's or can't says or something. Yeah. Does that and there's a chance question? your body will like react differently to be on the trail too. Yeah. Um, I think my like fat content went down, so you know I was. I don't know. I felt, it felt different. My body felt different in a, in a lot of ways. Thanks for that question. Uh, all right, let's take some more from the audience. So back here, yeah, and then we'll go up front. Yes, my name is Jill. How much total time did you plan on for your trip, and were you able to stick to your Time plan. Let's start over here with uh, David Blood. I think we might have planned 28 days and did it in 27. Nice. Yeah, but we did it basically on plan. I think we were going to end even earlier, but then we had to take a day and a half off. Gotcha. About 10 miles a day. It, you know, it doesn't feel yeah. like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Because it's that. never 10 miles, or like very rarely is it 10 miles. It's yeah. those like four mile days when you're going into town or headed out of town, and then like the 14 or 15 or 16 mile days. Like it, it's not an, an average, it's highly varied. We had a pretty cautious estimate of the 28 days, and we did it in 22 of the actual hiking. Wow. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh -oh. <clears throat> we did it in 27 the first time and actually felt that we probably could have done more because the rain was slowing us down. The second time we did it in 25 and that was pretty much what we had planned for, which means <laughs> that's how much food we had. It's all about how much food we had. <laughs> Although on the last night we actually were pretty thin the last day. We had two cookies and two crackers to go 13 miles. It's a really we good found, We found a half eaten cliff bar on the trail and we didn't pass it by. <laughs> nice. I would not pass well, it by. I wouldn't Love leave it. it. <laughs> All right. Yes. I have a two parter, but they're very closely related. Um, peak food craving and best trail snack. Ooh. Favorite trail snack. Boy, peak food, food craving and best trail snack. Oh, you really like that cliff bar. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't actually, crave actually, cliff bars. <laughs> Uh, Alan, you want to start us off? Oh, yeah, it's absolutely. I dream of pizza every <laughs> night. And you know, I want something salty and greasy. So, actually, my trail snack, I can't carry pizza, was plantain chips. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're a lot sturdier than potato chips, just a little bit salty. They really hit the spot easy on your tummy. Yeah. I got really sick of plantain chips. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we both. Well, maybe one of us said it and then it got in the other one's head, but we both really wanted salty and like olives and pickles and stuff too. Um, I always think of watermelon. Mm. Yeah. Ice cream is like great. I, yeah. <laughs> we opportunize oh ice cream a bunch. Um, our best snack for sure is peanut M&Ms and Monica taught me this one because they don't melt. So even when it's 100 degrees in July, <laughs> peanut M&Ms are good to go all the time and they're delicious. Um, and the funniest peak craving for sure was we were having that birthday dinner at Corliss and Monica's dad was the next resupply. And she, like dinner's being made and she's actively texting him like, wait, we need like olives. And <laughs> it was like a ridiculous- And blueberries, <laughs> beer. <laughs> so he showed up with like these, like four containers of canned dolmas and then a jar of olives and then a plastic wrap pack of olives and we had like 20 miles to go and we'd been trying to go pretty light and Monica's like, we're carrying these. Like, we're not carrying these. So like my dad it was this total role reversal because I was usually the overpacker and she's like, there's no way. We can't, can't, we can't bring the craisins. They're full of water. And, but they were so good and I have a really special place in my heart for dolmas ever since. <laughs> 
So my craving was a burger, like a nice juicy burger. <laughs> um, that's what I thought about for like half the time. <laughs> Honestly, on the trail, like three hours a day, I would just be like, <laughs> um, and that's why I got over eight. But the best trail food, like this beef strip, it was like beef jerky type thing. It was like a strip and it was really great. And that a typo on the packaging. Cause that's the, what I had to do all day. You know, I had to train myself somehow. So I combed through every single ingredients list and I found a typo. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> proud of that. <laughs> Maybe too proud. It, it was a, a 100 gram sausage that supposedly had two, two kilograms of potassium. <laughs> <laughs> Is that lethal? <laughs> that, I mean. <laughs> wanted, you know, really fatty uh, meat. Um, and, you know, like Blood said, that was some, it was like fantasizing about food is how you pass uh, a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. um, peak snack was, we had a thing of peanut butter. It was on a day where um, we thought we were gonna stay in a shelter. We got there and it was full of Boy Scouts that full of Boy Scouts. Um, it, it was maybe an hour before sundown and there was Skyline Lodge um, two miles away. So we're like, okay, we'll just uh, press on. And it turned out it was um, during a time of the year when there'd been a really bad windstorm. And so there were a ton of blowdowns on those two miles. And so it ended up- It was raining. And it was like raining and wind, and we thought, um, you know, blowdowns were going to end up on top of us. Um, so it, it was it was probably the one time on the trail where I felt like um, I'm like criminally negligent for bringing my son <laughs> and putting him in, in this situation because I was worried, I was scared. Um, we eventually got to the spur trail. Um, some. Uh, Forest Service or somebody had cut through the blowdowns on the spur trails, and that was awesome. We got there. We were both like, you know, Vlad more than me approaching hypothermia because um, he has no body fat. Um, <laughs> he stripped down, went inside, um, and the first snack that we had was some baking M&Ms, those are the tiny ones, and we just poured them onto the peanut butter and ate it with a spoon. <laughs> and that, that was the peak, peak snacking experience. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. Cool. Uh, great question. Yes, back here. Um, so I just, uh, hi, I'm Hannah, and uh, I wanted to ask like, what you guys did for training for the, uh, for the trail and if that was like, sufficient, like, and how long did it take you to get your trail legs? So we had a whole like regimen of hiking that we were gonna do. We were gonna do like two miles and three miles and four miles and five miles and six miles. We never did it. Like we did like three hikes. Um, I wish we had done it. The first four days I think were when we didn't have our trail legs and those were probably the hardest. Um, but day four at the end, the end, like the last four miles of day four were like amazing, right? That was the first time we discovered that stories make the miles go back so fast. And I felt like we just started when we reached the shelter. And we also met some really nice AT hikers. And that's kind of when we got into our stride and started being able to do higher mileage and, you know, got everything started going better from that on because the first couple days were rough. Yeah, the, like you're, you become a long distance hiker and it's just a question of how long that's gonna take. And if we trained more, it, it, those, it might not have been four days, it would have been less painful. Um, but man, it felt good after those four days. Um, that, that transition felt miraculous. Was Monica, did y'all do any training, any training regimens? <laughs> Hiking when we could. Uh, from Labor or Memorial Day to Never July before. 1st. <laughs> um, I like riding my bike and like going on runs and stuff, so I was just doing all that stuff before. Uh, I mean, at, you can do it. It just, I mean, if you're going for like speed or miles, you might need to prepare a bit more, but no matter what, we can all put one foot in front of the other and carry stuff on our back. Um, 
Uh-huh. I'm just remembering that my roommate thought it would be a good idea for t- me for training to put a 50-pound bag of cement in my backpack <laughs> and hike up to the Duxbury window because he was like, you're ready to go, but like you just need to practice carrying a bag. <laughs> so I did it, but I fell over and <laughs> couldn't get up. <laughs> 50 pounds is a lot. And it was, the, it was really sp- small because it's like cement is really dense and I saw these people it's like this little nice hike here in Vermont and I'm like (sighs) and they're like are you gonna make it to the window 1.8 miles from here I don't know (laughs) don't train that way (laughs) it's not necessary I mean no matter what you're gonna have hurt from carrying the weight so like I don't know if you're gonna be able to train your way out of that Um, but something else will always hurt more (laughs) <laughs> That's covered. Yeah. Uh, it's nice if it's not your feet. <laughs> nice. Uh, Ellen, you started hiking when you were 60. What sort of training well, we brought were, you to the long trail? We were, um, we were hiking about once a week. So actually our legs were in pretty good shape, but there is quite a difference between putting on the heavy pack as compared with the day pack. It's a whole lot harder to get up the hills. Um, We did only have one night of backpacking experience, and that is a big learning curve once you start out on your end-to-end hike. I have replaced all the gear pretty much that I bought the first time around because I found that it didn't work for me, and that includes all the recommendations I got from people. Mm -hmm. The gear thing is very individual. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, speaking of training, a uh, quick shout out to Ryan, who I met on trail last week with a bag full of water training for, for his end end. So there are many ways to, uh, to, to do the training. You should dump it out. Dump it out before you get out. So. It was very, very nice to offer me some as well. Um, Excellent. Um, I want to um, hit on one thing I'm seeing a lot in our online questions real quick, and that is the topic of travel arrangements. Um, real quick, I'd, I'd love to, to pull the panel and see kind of how you transported to or from the, the, the northern or southern terminus. Uh, and then I want to um, potentially add some thoughts as well for our online viewers who are mostly out of state and potentially coming from far away. Um, so let's, let's start down there and kind of how did you transport to and from the, the far ends? Um, my wife, Ala, who's sitting in back, dropped us off uh, in Williamstown. We got a later start because um, it was like, yeah, my pack's whatever, 60 pounds, and his was 45. So it was like, oh, God, we've got to get rid of more weight. And so that made us late, so we didn't start hiking until 4.30 that day. And, wow. You know, that, that was rough. Um, my dad uh, picked us up at the end. You know, it was crazy driving with him to Waterbury to drop somebody off, and it's like just the compression of time and space after you've been on the trail. Mm-hmm. It's not fair. Why do cars get to go so fast? <laughs> <laughs> Friends and family for us. Cool. But if people are are coming from from out of state, uh, I think Vermont's a pretty decent place to hitchhike, and there's some awesome trail angel resources as well as GMC resources. Um, I mean, you can call me and I'll come pick you up at the end if you want to. <laughs> call Monica. Call yeah. Monica. <laughs> yeah. You heard it here. <laughs> yeah, we had family take us down to start and pick us up, so that's not very helpful. But I know that, in, I believe that in the guide there's a list of trail angels, and my understanding is that they will help you out. Yeah. Uh, anyone who, who is looking for rides uh, can contact us here at, at Green Mountain Club headquarters. We keep a list of uh, volunteer shuttle drivers and trail angels that will, you know, they all have their own like personal rates that they will charge. Uh, and a lot of those folks, um, what they do with that money is they donate it back to the club at the end of the year. So it's like you're, you're donating to the club and the trail, but you're doing it through your driver, sort of. So that's another option as well. We gave rides to a bunch of other through hikers too. So like when we had support, we would take people into town, help them resupply, drop them off at a different location if they were back a few miles or something. Um, So there's a good chance you'll meet people on on the trail. And that's kind of the spirit of it. People who are in for the weekend. Mm -hmm. Not not at the beginning and the end, but uh, for resupply. Nice. All right, we're gonna, we have time for just one more audience question, and then we'll break off into our, into our small groups. So, 
Uh, yes, right. Take it away. Sorry for taking so many. Um, how did you guys deal with ticks out there? Ooh, ticks. I'm a rather furry individual, and I'm relatively <laughs> afraid. afraid of ticks. As you should be. Yeah. yeah. They're the worst. Ticks are very, very relevant. They've become a big problem. So, yeah, ticks. Some thoughts. Well, ticks are always on your mind, <laughs> but they're, they're really hard to see. Uh, you know, you are advised to do a tick check every night, but I'll tell you, you're so tired and it's often dark that it's difficult. Um, we, uh, we did find one tick on Morgan once on the trail. Um, you know, people wear uh, low gaiters in the summer. I think that's probably helpful. We actually gave up on um, bug repellent, but my understanding is that you can treat your clothing with things that you wouldn't want to put on your body, like DEET, that are helpful. Yeah. Ticks were one of my number one fears, for sure, and I did a lot of research into permethrin treatment before, um, and you know, I just feel like it's, it's becoming more and more of an issue each year almost. People, Lyme cases popping up and uh, people find ticks on them, their dogs and whatever, their friends. Uh, so we treat it, we, I bought like a gallon or something or like a quart of permethrin, diluted it to the proper concentration um, and soaked our socks, shorts, tent. Um, I think I did one of my shirts an outer layer maybe really like all our soft goods yeah so things that were going to be at places where ticks could come in <laughs> um, that's a treatment that bonds chemically to the fabric um, they use it on baby blankets it's safe um, as long as it dries in the shade and completely dries it's good for like 10 washes even um, there's a bunch of much more you can read about it but that made me at least have some peace of mind that ticks weren't we're deterred from our tent. We're deterred from crawling up my, past my sock. Um, it's probably not perfect, but um, the shorts too, like that's an area that they want to go. So, um, what's it called? Permethrin, oh, yeah. and it needs to be diluted to like half a percent or something. Mm -hmm. So, uh, definitely do your research and YouTube. Um, but I went ended up going to Farm and Garden Store to get the the bulk that I needed. Um, I was gonna do the backpack too, but it didn't fit in the tub that I was using. <laughs> you can also get spray on permethrin treatments or clothing uh, by certain brands that has it in there. And there's probably people that look down upon it as well, but to me, ticks are worse. <laughs> we used the spray on on our shoes and on our gaiters, and that was it. Uh, we were most concerned about picking up ticks from our dog because um, he was sharing the same sleeping space. And uh, we just got lucky that yeah, yeah, we were super fortunate not to end up with a single tick. I don't think we even saw one. I mean, it might have been the time of year, but we definitely got lucky. And I would still advise to use permethrin and other measures to make sure that you do not pick up ticks. We didn't have seen that many either, for the record. But we also carried a tick spoon, which is a, a good way to get ticks off. So. It's lightweight, I think it's worth it. So, uh, thank you all uh, so much. We're gonna take the next uh, almost 15 minutes now, um, and we're gonna have our panel. Can I, can I say one more thing? Um, so, I work for the health department, but that's not why I'm giving this advice. Um, <laughs> so the health department piece is that uh, Lyme disease is, has higher prevalence in Southern Vermont than it does in Northern Vermont. Um, it's a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, Lyme disease is not the only uh, disease you need to be concerned about. There's also anaplasmosis, um, and the counts of anaplasmosis are starting to approach those of, of Lyme disease. Um, I, I was really concerned about um, us getting a tick bite, and so we talked to our respective physicians ahead of time, and we got um, a prophylactic amount of the antibiotic that they prescribe, and so, um, if you meet certain conditions, which are that you, you think the tick has been attached for you know, a certain amount of time, um, then it, it's indicated to take this prophylactic uh, antibiotic. It's only for Lyme disease, um, but that gave us a little peace of mind um, that both of us had 
you know, a few doses each in case we got a tick bite where we, did, we thought that the tick might have been attached for more than 12 hours or what, whatever the conditions are. Excellent, excellent advice. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, so we're gonna have our, our panelists now split up into kind of different areas of the room. Uh, feel free to, uh, don't mob them please, or go straight in their backpacks without asking permission, but uh, this is gonna be a free uh, question and answer time uh, kind of off, off the camera. Uh, online folks, I'm gonna jump on the computer for the next 10 minutes and try and answer any questions we did not answer uh, here with our panelists. Um, so let's uh, do that, and then when it's nine o'clock, I'll, uh, I'll call everyone back together for a quick wrap up. Thank you.